Yvon André Estelle, born in Paris, February 8, 1936. My mother and father met during World War I. Uh, the family story is uh, that she was doing volunteer packages uh, for the prisoners in a Navy ministry building on the Place de la Concorde. Uh, when my father came in, who was some years, seven, eight years older, she was 18, 19, and he was on leave from the front uh, and wanted to send a package to one of his friends who was a prisoner. So the rest of the family story is, is that he was quite taken with my mother but too shy to really approach her. So he kept coming back and coming back and sending other packages and eventually, of course, he asked her out. And she, according to the same story she told me, was immediately taken with him. And eventually, a few years later, they got married. So the funny end of the story is that the war ends and they have their first apartment. And there's a knock on the door. My mother goes down to open it and somebody she doesn't know. And he says, does Andre still live here? She says, yes, my husband. And she says, well, can I talk to him? So my father comes down and the man hugs him and kisses him and says, I'm the most grateful person on the face of the earth. We hardly knew each other, and you sent me 23 packages. <laughs> so that's, what, that's when they met. Um, and they got married, I think, about around the end of the war, 1918. My mother's father, his name was Eugene Crémieux, and he was a very famous lawyer in France and in fact one of the first, if not the first, uh, Jewish lawyers uh, to practice before the equivalent of the French Supreme Court. My father was in World War I. He was an officer and actually in a sort of equivalent of an intelligence unit, analysis and intelligence unit. And then he got gassed, luckily not badly enough to really leave a long trace uh, but enough to get him sent home. My uncle on my mother's side, Raymond, he was a pilot. And um, he died from an air crash after the war, not during the war. My father actually uh, was an electrical engineer. So I'll tell you another family story. My mother was very proud of the fact he was an electrical engineer. And when the doorbell stopped functioning in their apartment, she said, can you fix this? And he said, of course. So she heard a lot of noise and commotion. And he came up the stairs and said, done. She said, you fixed it? You're, you know, you're my hero. So she goes down to try the doorbell and he put a note on the door that said, doorbell out of order, please knock. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's the family story. But anyway, he was an electrical engineer, and in 1912, I think it was, before the First World War, he was sent um, to work on some project in Vancouver in Canada, and um, when he was there, there was a big financial crash, because everybody had thought Vancouver would be the gateway to Asia, which 60 years or 70 years later turned out to be true, but there was a big bubble in real estate and it crashed, and the French consul, who had speculated in land, went under, stole the, whatever government money was in the consulate and disappeared. And my father, being sort of the only Frenchman around, was named temporary consul. 
and he actually bought a little bit of land which we owned for a very long time. Uh, but more interestingly, in, he met a, a guy, a Frenchman, who was a streetcar conductor. I mean, he was very well educated, but had come to America, and the only job he'd found was a streetcar. He came, but he's an architect. So my father let, gave him, said, let's build a house on this empty land and see if we can sell it, which they did. And that man eventually became the first president of a big French car company called Citroën, which was also allied, complicated reasons, with Michelin, the tire company. And so in the 20s, when my father started a bank with his two friends that he traveled around the world with, one of whom was a Schlumberger. Uh, they, uh, Citroën and Michelin, opened big accounts at the bank and made it a big success. My mother uh, uh, was was very fine mother, but in the French style, if you want to call it that, she wasn't the warm and warm and cuddly, and she was focused very much on my father. So Nana's role was doubly important. She wasn't a baby nurse, she was a, more what we would call a nanny. And indeed, her name was Nana. I mean, that's what I called her, and she became Nana to the family. She was really like a second mother to me. Her, she was from the Basque country. Uh, near Bordeaux, uh, she came to take care of me when I was two years old. Uh, and she was an amazing woman who had a you know very brief education and training as a nurse. So she came to work for us in 1938. I was two, and in 1940, the Germans invaded, and it's another story, but. My mother took, took us all out of France, and it's a long story, through Spain into Portugal, and from there we came to the United States. Um, but the point was that she wasn't Jewish, she was, couldn't have been more Catholic, but she just picked up and left with us, and she stayed for 50 years for the rest of her life. Uh, and was an extraordinary woman. She learned to ski, play tennis, um, drive. Neither one of my parents drove. <laughs> if you could. Uh, and um, paint. We have wonderful paintings from her, sort of in the Grandma Moses primitive style. And um, read. She'd read all these books. And she was just extraordinarily warm and loving, and she played a very important part in my life. I loved her very much and felt very loved by her. The Germans invaded in May, and by early June, they were in Paris. When they invaded into Belgium and Holland, which was the just in May, end of May, and they, the French had built this supposedly perfect defense, which was this line called the Maginot Line, made of bunkers. And, and the Germans just went around it and through the forest in Belgium called the Ardennes Forest, which nobody had thought they would, but of course they pulverized everything. The French collapsed, there was Dunkirk. Um, and as that was happening, my father was here in the United States as a private banker, but on a mission for the French government to get U.S. aid for rearming. Like, at that time, the U.S. Uh, was a very isolationist. Franklin Roosevelt was not, but the Congress was. So the idea was that Congress had said, you can't get involved in Europe. So the British had negotiated something called Lend-Lease which was a way around. They'd lend them and lease them ships, which technically didn't break the, the law and 
my father was part of a group that came to try to negotiate this when the invasion occurred. So he called my mother and he said, grab the children and leave. And um, so that's exactly what she did. Her parents, by the way, said to her, if you leave, you're a traitor to France. Nothing bad's going to happen to us, which was, you know, a very common misconception because their knowledge was World War I, which was incredibly horrible war and millions killed in the trenches. But there was, you know, separate camp for officers and there was a sort of respect that didn't, of course, exist in World War II, and there wasn't the same anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish credo that Hitler had. And so uh, they said, your brother was a war hero, uh, nothing, you know. Nothing. But my, mo my mother, who's a very strong woman, who lived to be 99, um, said, my husband tells me to leave, I leave. So she picked up, there were three children and Nana, and she didn't drive. So we had some money, and so she was able to get sort of taxis and occasional cars and so on. Um, but I remember, that's one of the earliest memories I have, is the sort of stream of people heading south towards the southern part of France and to it, and the German planes, you know, strafing uh, the convoys. But I don't know how much of it's a real memory and how much of it is having seen the black and white movies. But And then we were able to get um, into, from France into Spain, which was very difficult. The journey itself, I don't remember all the details, obviously. It was a variety of cars and means and ways to get down there. And we talked briefly about how we would never really understood how our mother got us across the border. Um, uh, but uh, it's clear she had some help indirectly from my father and her own perseverance in doing it. When we ended up in Lisbon, Lisbon was then a, a, a common place for refugees, and everybody wanted to get into the United States. But it was very hard to get visas. And beyond that, there was this way of controlling it, which was a de facto Catch-22, which was to get a boat ticket, you needed a visa. And to get a visa, you had to have a boat ticket. So obviously, it stopped most of the people. Many of them went to South America, to Cuba, um, some to Canada, but that wasn't easy either. Uh, luckily, through my father had in World War I and met this, my father was sent after he'd been gassed and sent back, he'd been sent to America to sell war bonds, French war bonds. And he had, during that time, met this uh, family uh, and lived in Connecticut called the Alsop family. And uh, it happened that the son of the woman parents that he'd met by the time World War II rolled around uh, was a reporter, but he was also a nephew of the Roosevelt's and actually had his initial office, if you can believe it, in the White House. It was a different world. And he, in turn, uh, certainly helped uh, in addition to the other documents that I've mentioned in trying to get the visas. So we were able to get the visas and take a, a, a Greek ship uh, to the United States. <laughs>
Yes, we had to go on a technicality to Canada and come back on a, it's called a re-entry visa, and then we were legal. One of the other things that I remember from that age is we were obviously all up early in the morning as the boat was coming in. It was pretty exciting. And I saw my father on a tender coming towards the ship. So I screamed to my mother, you know, there's Papa, there's Papa. And she said, don't be silly. He's waiting for us on the dock. You know, when you're a child, you're powerless and you hate being treated unfairly. So I felt incredibly treated unfairly that my mother wouldn't believe, I wouldn't know my father. You know, don't forget their whole lives had been in France. America was, at that time, was a five, six year interlude. In 1940, my mother was, in, was uh, 42 years old and my father was Fifty-four or something. So their whole lives and culture and everything else. You know, I really don't remember very much about in that in that terms. It was very different. I mean, uh, my parents did not discuss a lot of the history that I've learned since. First. They were much older and I was much younger, so it wasn't that kind of conversation. And secondly, um, uh, my father was a very typical for France, uh, sort of French intellectual who was uh, an atheist and uh, didn't practice Judaism at all. I didn't even know we were Jewish till I figured it out when I was nine or ten years old or something. That was not atypical. I mean, today it sounds so strange, uh, but it was not atypical at all at that time. People that were sort of in that world and were Jewish but were atheists didn't practice. My mother probably, I found a little star of David in her things. And I'm sure she had, if there had been bat mitzvahs at that time, which they weren't, they're an American invention for girls, um, uh, she probably would have had one. I'm sure she had some, some bit of religious training, but she never mentioned it or discussed it. Very little, there was, a, such a strong anti-German attitude because of the war, but the full extent of it uh, I didn't understand till later, if you want to call it that. And also don't forget that there was no widespread knowledge about the camps till 44, 45. Uh, there was some knowledge, but not anything wide you know, widespread, though obviously the anti-Jewish horrors of the Germans were, were well known. Mm -hmm. But my mother would never countenance. I remember when I bought, years later, I bought a Volkswagen. I couldn't tell her <laughs> that I bought a Volkswagen. <laughs> Just recently, a friend of mine found all these archives at Yale and there's telegrams and letters from my father and a famous American columnist that he knew and the State Department that he knew people at because of his mission uh, saying the Estelle family do what you can to help get them in, out of the country. My grandparents were then six months had been picked up by the Germans and taken to a detention camp called Drancy, um, which if they had stayed in what turned out to be a way station to the concentration camps. <laughs>
but the concentration camps were not built until 1942 um, fully. There were lots of other bad things, obviously, that were happening. Um, but at that time, his law partner, uh, who was not Jewish, was able to buy them out. And it was a form of bail. In other words, he put up a caution that said, if you let them come back to Paris, this money is yours if they leave again. Now, in fact, they didn't leave, and I'm sure he never saw the money anyway. <laughs> but you could do that at that stage of the war. And uh, they survived. There was a very famous doctor who was our pediatrician, um, whom the Germans, for various reasons, wanted to do certain medical things in France for them. And it is thought, though we don't know, that he may have protected them, because they were his first clients, or first patients. And his son of the doctor, his name was Robert Debray, became uh, was Michel Debray who became Prime Minister under de Gaulle. My father was a financial advisor to General de Gaulle during the war and went to London several times on military planes to advise him on what France's financial system should look like if and when the war ended. And then we found, I just got a 20-page memo that my father wrote in 1939, just before the war, uh, which is marked that FDR had read it. Jean-Francois, yes. He was, at that time, yeah, I would guess he was 21 or 22 years old and he was in North Africa and with two friends he got from North Africa to Brazil. When he came through New York, as I said, he was probably 21 and I was four to five. So I didn't really know him, but I remember his sort of playing with me the way a father or a much older brother would and tossing me around uh, which I loved, of course, as a kid. And, and the only thing that I really remembered was, apart from that, was this watch he had. And the reason it stuck in my mind is because it's, I found out after, of course, it's uh, made by a company called Jaeger Lecrute, and it's called a Reverso. And they still make a version of it uh, today. And uh, the the watch face reverses to a metal plaque, so it was used to protect the watch. So you could flip it and see the time, flip it back, and you wouldn't see a, a watch face. All you'd see is metal. There were two school friends who also went with him, and then he found his way up here and enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force. And unfortunately, it's the, one of those horrible things, he made it all this way and through all that. And then they, since he was gonna be a pilot, he had a tonsil issue. And they didn't want him having choking issues in the airplane, so they, very standard. They, at that time, nobody does it anymore, but it was standard take out your tonsils. And somewhere, somehow, there are a couple of different versions of what happened. He never woke up. One version was it was the anesthesia. Another version, it's probably likelier, as they made a mistake and cut into his artery. It couldn't have been sadder. He's buried in Ottawa. And my eldest son, my existing son, um, it's called John Francis. That when we arrived in America, well, things were very rough at that time. 
food. It was the, the next two winters were extraordinarily cold, and there was very little coal. Um, you know, because it had all been used up for war purposes, so things were things were were you know were very tough. We always spoke only French at home, especially in all those years. Way late, you know. In my mother's later years, we might intersperse an English phrase if it was more fitting. My my mother had learned English and German, which she wouldn't admit till fifty years later, um, from her nanny. Even. At the same time as she was learning, or before she was learning French, so my mother's English was fabulous. You wouldn't hardly have known she was French. My father always spoke with a French, uh, pronounced French accent, though he spoke obviously very good English um, that he learned. Um, but it was uh, I loved having both languages, which luckily I still do today. So in my mother's later years, one day she said to me, she had a little office in her apartment, but she she typed all my father's papers and everything else, um, and she always answered every letter the same day. That was, she was extraordinarily disciplined. Um, so she's sitting in her office, and, and I come visit her. So. My fifties or something by then, or so. and she says to me, "You know, I have a secret to tell you. I've never told you." I said, "Oh my God, I can't. My father's not my father. You know, I can't imagine what it is." And so she said, "You see, this picture over here, and I'll show you the picture. I still have it. This was my grandparents' country house. It was a big house." And she said, pointing to one of the windows, she said, "You see that window there?" I said, "Yes." And she said, "That was Proust's room." And I said, "What do you mean it was Proust's room?" She said, "Well, he was in school with your uncle Maxi, whom I'd never met, obviously, with the time,、um, and he'd come and spend the weekend." And I said, "Why didn't you tell me?" You know how much I love Proust, and she said, "Well, we never told anybody because you know we didn't want anyone to think that Uncle Maxi was, you know." <laughs> and I thought, you know, in America they would have had a plaque, you know, it says Marcel Proust slept here, you know. <laughs>